what we are doing for Lord willing this Sunday and two more, we're going to be looking at the life, um, a really an unparalleled life, the life of William Carey. Um, this is not a book review, but I am promoting this book. Um, for me personally, outside the Bible, I can't think of another book that has influenced me more than this one. Uh, so I just encourage you to fight for the five or six copies that are out there, but do it with love. Um, but this is the biography written by his great-grandson, um, S. Pierce Carey. Um, so we're going to look at his life, and it's challenging to figure out how on earth do you even do something like this. I don't know. You're my guinea pigs, and I'm the mad scientist, so here we go. As we get started, let's pray, because we're going to be thinking about really important things, spiritual things. We're going to be looking at God's word, and we're going to want God to make an impact on us through the life of a faithful servant, and we should ask for his help. Let's pray. Father, we do ask for your help this morning. Thank you for the life of William Carey. Thank you for how he has uh, been enjoying your presence um, for so long now, after a faithful life on the Great Commission for your namesake. Thank you for the way that India was impacted centuries ago by him. Lord, we pray that he would still speak today, uh, his life would speak to us, that our lives would be changed. Um, not because he in and of himself has any power to change anybody, but because you were at work in him and what you accomplished in him, you can use that with your power, with your grace, by your spirit, alongside your word to shape us into the people we must be. And we ask for this help in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to think about Abraham and Sarah with me for a moment. How did God bring about the nation that he will work through to bless all of the nations? from a childless man and a barren woman comes a nation. Think about Moses. How does God bring about for the very first time on earth his perfect word from a man who admitted he was not very good with words came God's perfect word for the very first time on the earth? I want you to think about David. How does God bring about the most powerful king over the nation of Israel with an unrivaled army? Well, from a shepherd boy with sheep comes a mighty king with a powerful army. Listen, from nothingness, God gets everything he intends. From nothingness, he gets everything he intends. He intends. From a childless, barren couple comes a nation. From the nothingness of a man who's not very good with words comes God's perfect word. From the nothingness of a, a forgettable boy watching his father's sheep comes a mighty king with armies. And this is God's way. It is the only way that he brings about everything that he intends in this world. He starts with nothing, just like when he created Everything out of nothing. Everything he wants comes out of nothingness, and he gets the glory. And this is our story. You could have no other story with God's, within God's greater story. Paul's words to the Corinthians might be ringing in your ears right now, and they fit for you and me. God has chosen the foolish things. God has chosen the weak things. God has chosen the base things of the world. God has chosen the despised things. God has chosen the things that are not. And he does it all so that no flesh may boast before God. And this is the storyline of a humble servant of Jesus Christ named William Carey. He is no exception to this way that God works. His biographer says this, they, meaning the collection of small rural churches in England that banded together to send Kerry to India, they felt themselves so helpless. Theirs were such little flocks, and their people were illiterate and poor. 
and they could neither be expected to grasp nor support such a vast undertaking. In any case, they lacked experience, they lacked precedent to guide them. Overall, they seemed to themselves to be too inland, too isolated to direct such an overseas effort. The great centers and churches, they said, they must take the initiative and shoulder the burden. None of this should surprise us. In human terms, they really were nobodies from nowhere with no influence beyond their village bounds. And what hope there is for each one of us because God can accomplish everything he wants for his glory, not for ours, but for his glory, even though and especially because you're a nobody from nowhere with no influence. Here are my goals for the series this week and the next two, Lord willing. My goal is I want to encourage a bunch of nobodies from nowhere with no influence. Just to be faithful to Jesus Christ where God has you. Be faithful to his word. Don't wish that you were not in the lowly providence that God has given to you. Don't don't wish you were someplace else. Embrace where he has put you, not by accident, but on purpose. God knows and God is at work and he has plans for you and he has plans for your usefulness if you will simply be faithful to him. Another goal I have is that most of all, I would help you see that God is never at a disadvantage in your life. God is never at a disadvantage in your life. And especially on the Great Commission. He will overcome what you and I call obstacles and threats. God doesn't have obstacles and threats. He's God. He wins the Great Commission. I also have the goal to just ignite or maybe reignite your interest in or curiosity about William Carey and that you would study his life, that you would read um, his biography, that you would diagram the sentences. Just kidding, don't diagram the sentences. But that is a good idea, maybe, for me. I want to stir some of you up to surrender your life to Jesus Christ for the Great Commission at the ends of the earth. I want some of you to do that. That's my prayer. To undertake what William Carey did to the glory of Christ and the good of sinners far away. And then I want to stir up the rest of you, because not all of you are going to go. My goal is to stir up the rest of you to passionately send more missionary church planters and Bible translators to the ends of the earth. I want to encourage and stir the rest of you up to sacrificially support them and uphold them. So those are the goals for the series. We'll see if we hit it or not. I'll just tell you my own personal interest in this book. This is my favorite biography. I first read it in August of 2003 when I was meeting, I was in the midst of meeting weekly with the elders of a little church called East Valley Bible Church Tempe about coming to pastor here. And God's use of William Carey among unreached peoples of India, it made me long for whatever church I was going to go to one day to invest heavily in unreached language groups. And you know what? By his grace, we did. And we are. In Papua New Guinea, the Cans, the Dodds, the Laymans, the Mitchells, and now the Twombleys, those are your investment, Grace Bible Church, in the salvation of unreached people in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. And I just happen to also be a president of a sending ministry that helps churches get to those unreached language groups. And so there's no book outside of the Bible, I believe, that is more instructive and helpful for church planting and Bible translation at the ends of the earth than this biography. How should you listen to this series? I don't know. I just listen. <laughs> um, I wouldn't get caught up thinking, okay, what, he was born 1761, died 1834. I, don't write that stuff down. You can read that. But what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to distill some lessons from his life and ministry that will fall into several different lesson categories. And maybe that's where I would try to take some notes. You might even be able to make some headlines on paper or in your, your digital version of lesson categories and, and maybe 
jot some nuggets that come to you in those areas. Let me give to you the, what I think are possible five lesson categories that we're going to get some nuggets from, okay? Here's the first one, the first lesson categories, uh, category. It's the undeniable evidence that God is never at a disadvantage. We're going to hammer on this one today big time. Resurrected Jesus, why don't you turn to Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. You know these verses. You don't even need to probably turn there. You've got to memorize or they're so familiar. But resurrected Jesus never made his great commission dependent on governments cooperating with him. He never made his great commission dependent on economic conditions being favorable, on churches firing on all theological cylinders, and his servants being respected and viewed as credible. Look at Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You will never find your spot yourself in a location where his authority is not present and powerful. And you know how it ends. I am with you to the end of the age. Not only is his power and his authority everywhere, but he's there, not separated from his power. Jesus Christ is therefore never at a disadvantage when you live where you live and he commands you to go where he wants you to go. His authority is over every square inch of the planet and he is present. He's never at a disadvantage. That doesn't mean everything is going to go smoothly for you. It doesn't mean everything will be painless for you. It doesn't mean that you'll never question why he has currently put you in his providence that he puts you in. But there is no place, there is no providence outside of his authority. And he says, go. Let's couple that with Acts chapter 17. I want you to go to Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Paul is in Athens. And he says this to the smart guys, the philosophers. He says, and God made from one man every nation of mankind to inhabit all the face of the earth. And this is it right here. Having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Listen, the times that you live in, he appointed. He appointed you to live now. And the boundaries of, your, of the providential place that you live and just work out your life is right here, right now. No mistakes. And that one says, I put you where I put you. I put you in the time that I put you. I have authority over every square inch of the planet. I am at no disadvantage. Obey me and go. I'll be with you. God was never at a disadvantage even though William Carey's nation and Europe and India and the world was on fire. The second lesson category is the unmistakable pathway to the unreached. The unmistakable pathway to the unreached. Over and over throughout his biography, you can see God's masterful arrangement of experiences and giftings and divine appointments that had William Carey on an unmistakable pathway to the unreached people of India. Everything that God was doing in Carey's life, it moved to that end. And the benefit of writing a biography of somebody after that person is dead is you can look back on God's providence and you can see things like that. But when it's happening in real time, it's really hard to see that's what's going on. Joseph doesn't get thrown into the pit by his brothers and he doesn't say, don't worry guys, I see where this is going. It's going to be okay. He couldn't see that. And you might be in a situation right now in your life where you're like, I have no idea where this is going. God doesn't feel that way. God knows how to create the pathway to get his choice servants to the places that he wants to use them and have them be fruitful in. Some of you are on the path right now to unreached language groups and you may not even know it. William Carey didn't know it for some time. But it was unmistakable what God was doing. A third category for lessons to learn is the undisputable characteristics of a useful life. William Carey didn't start being useful when the ship docked in the Bay of Bengal in India. He was a choice instrument in the hands of the king of the Great Commission starting the moment he was converted at age 17 and a half in rural England. Scripture displays the kind of characteristics 
that God is most pleased to see in servants that he uses for his glory. And we're going to look at many of those biblical traits that are essential in William Carey's life and in others that will help you to be useful to him. And the hope is that we'll be inspired to press on ourselves in those same character qualities so that we can be useful for Jesus Christ where he has us. The fourth lesson is the undesirable missteps to learn from. There were some missteps that they took that, were, that are undesirable. There is so much that went right in sending William Carey. There was so much that went right in the team that he formed in Serampore, India. There is so much that went right in the work of Bible translation. There is so much wisdom that abounded. It was truly astounding, especially in the light of the fact that they didn't have a prior example from a British church missionary really to follow uh, who went a five-month boat ride away to the other side of the earth to serve. Yes, Acts provides for every generation the biblical convictions that you need for the Great Commission, but it takes wisdom in each generation's providential setting to figure out the tangibles of how do we get from here to there. There was a lot of things that went right as they navigated that, and there were some missteps that were made unknowingly and foolishly that we should learn from. There's lots of leadership lessons to dig into. And then the last category of lessons is the unimaginable dilemmas that servants face. Unimaginable dilemmas when you go to the ends of the earth for Jesus Christ's sake. Pioneer missionaries like uh, William Carey were put into dilemmas and they chose to put themselves into dilemmas that you and I cannot imagine happening. I'll just give you the one dilemma that stands out the most. It may be the only one that we end up talking about, but it comes out over and over. The cost of going on the Great Commission to India and engaging in that work so that peoples and tribes and tongues and nation, a nation could hear the gospel and believe in Jesus Christ and be around the throne of Christ one day praising his name, that came at an excruciating cost for the family of William Carey. Children died on the field from fevers. Team members' wives and children drowned when the boat capsized on a river that they were traveling on. William Carey's first wife went insane on the field. And the same is true for many other missionaries who went to the ends of the earth in those days. John Payton, a, a Scottish missionary to the New Hebrides. Before William Carey, David Brainerd, among the American Indians. It feels like you are put between two impossible choices. Either we go so that the unreached can be reached with the gospel and some of our family might die or suffer greatly in doing so, or we stay home so that we all stay safe, but the lost at the ends of the earth remain lost. I'm not interested in making a Monday morning quarterback call on what William Carey did or what he should have done or might have done differently, but I want you to feel the sobering dilemmas that were unimaginable that they were in constantly for Christ's sake on the Grace Commission so that it burdens you to pray for those that are at the ends of the earth on the Great Commission. And for those who are thinking about going, they must count the cost, and you need to pray for them as they do that. All right, so with the ground rules and the preparations needed for this series laid out, let's begin the survey of William Carey's life, and most importantly, the survey of God's greatness in and through his life. Let me just give you a very short overview of his life. He's called the father of modern missions. What you and I are now so familiar with today regarding world missions, cross-cultural missions, missions that goes to faraway peoples and places, we owe most of that to the book of Acts, of course, and to the Bible. But then we also owe it to God's choice servant who in 1793 left England and he sailed for five months to India. And William Carey is the one who started it in the modern era. Carey was probably, according to the biographer, the most productive missionary church planter and Bible translator of all time. That's quite a statement to make. 
He was born in 1761. Now, I want you to put your founding of our country hat on as you listen to this guy and think about this guy. 1761, he was born. And he died in 1834 at the age of 72. He was born in rural England. He was raised in rural England, converted in rural England, pastored in the countryside of England during his first 32 years before he ever sailed for India. And he spent the last 40 years of his life in India. Never came home. Never had a furlough. He and his team were translated some 212,000 resources into 40 different languages around 1800. He and his team, 212,000 different resources into 40 different languages. Detractors who were back home who heard about all of this, they found it hard to believe and they accused them of making up languages, inventing languages. The rural churches that he was in and grew up in and was pastoring before he left, all the others just like his they were, that, that were in association with one another, they were not ready to send a missionary anywhere, especially to the ends of the earth. William Carey actually had to create the very launch pad that he would then have to step up onto and be launched from, and he did that. And all William Carey had was the Bible and a short list of biographies of some missionaries like John Eliot in the 1600s who went to the American Indians on our continent and David Brainerd who did the same. And that was it. That's all he had. And yet he found God's word totally sufficient to guide him to the ends of the earth. It's clear from William Carey's life and ministry that his greatest burden that he felt was where God's greatest gifting was in his life. That was the gift, the skill of learning languages. Okay, you heard about his team and what his team did, right? 40 different languages. Carey was given the opportunity, according to our biographer, He was given the the opportunity, the power, and the joy of rendering God's word or precious portions thereof into 35 languages to a very empire of peoples. That's what William Carey did alone. 35. Translated the Bible in or portions of the Bible into 35 different languages. One of his teammates said after he died, he scarcely left a translation to be attempted on this side of India. And Kerry knew that, though the living messenger was important to preach the word, the book itself in the mother tongue of the people was a permanent missionary. And that's why he did what he did. Let's talk about some lessons just from that. So we're going to pause from his timeline, his life, and just think about the undisputable characteristics of a useful life. If God gives you a skill, if God gives you a gift, use it. Use it for his glory. The useful life does not squander the gift that God gives. Here is what you'll frequently find. It's where God has given you a gift, you probably got a burden to use it. Sometimes you discover it the other way around, where your heart is burdened, you'll find that you have the ability to step into that and bring some good. I always think about my friend and our missionary that we support in Italy, Massimo. I met him in ninth grade. And from that point on, he he was gifted in evangelism. Every conversation I have with him, even the one I had with him this last week, it always reveals his burden for those around him to know Christ. He is burdened in the area that he is gifted in, and he is gifted in the area that he's burdened for. Use and sharpen the skills, the gifts that God gives you. Don't squander them. Don't bury them. Let me give you another lesson of the undisputable characteristic of a useful life. It has to do with this quote that I just read to you. Carrie knew that though the living messenger was important to preach the word, the book itself, the Bible, in the mother tongue of the people, that was a permanent missionary. One of the many reasons Kerry was useful for Christ was that he saw himself and he saw his responsibility in light of the exalted place that God's word had on the field among people. What made him a great missionary was not that he made himself the focal point and that he made the Indians dependent upon him. 
No, God's word was the focal point. He was a means, and God was pleased to use means on the Great Commission. He always is. But the means, the servants whom are most useful in his hands are those who know they are only a means and not the power. And Carey was a good missionary because he made the Bible and the God of the Bible the main thing. What makes you a good spouse? It's that you make the Bible the main thing in your marriage. What makes you a good parent? That you put the Bible in front of everybody in your home. What makes you an effective tool in the body of Christ? It's that you put the Bible between you and your brothers and sisters. What makes you good at evangelism? It depends on the extent that you make the Bible the focal point. Well, that provides an overall summary of his life. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the beginning, and what you'll find is I'll I'll, I'll go forward in his life a little bit, and then we'll go back, and then we'll pick up some more things, and we'll keep making our way forward. And and, um, I think I need more than three Sundays, but it's okay. I'll deal with it. Look, I would, if it was my choice, there are like, I don't know, 30 some chapters in that. I would sit, I would have 30 meetings with people who wanted to talk about William Carey. It's just so great. Um, Let's talk about his birth. 1761 in rural England in a village called Pollersbury. That part of the country was looked down upon by the sophisticated and educated people of London. We call that kind of territory in our country flyover country. That's where he was born. Kerry went to school until he was 14. He had an eighth grade education. British life that Kerry grew up into was a tumultuous one. When he was 12 years old, the Boston Tea Party took place. At least 12. The British were having great national upheaval. They were about to lose their precious colonies in America. By 1789, when William Carey was 28 years old, the French Revolution had reached its first climax of many many that they had. The French blockaded their coast and fired upon British ships sailing past. The British had to sail in convoys to be safe, and missionaries were in there, maybe, part of some of that. The slave trade in Great Britain had reached its despicable zenith, So nationally, there was great upheaval going on. There was national tragedies and moral tragedies and wickedness going on. And Europe was turbulent. That was the times that God determined for William Carey. And here's your lesson. And this is going to be the one that we're going to drill down the most on today. This is the undeniable evidence that God in that setting was never at a disadvantage. That seems just to me like not very good timing for a British missionary or at a minimum, it seems like a huge obstacle to raising up and supporting missionaries to send from far away to faraway places from rural England. But when has the world not been on fire since uh, Genesis 3? God does not look at national morality. He doesn't look at national security. He doesn't look at continental stability. He doesn't look at international tranquility as prerequisites for the Great Commission. He doesn't care about that stuff in regards to his Great Commission. Our world that we live in right now, it feels like the spark has been released in the Hindenburg and it's getting hot. Is it really the time to raise up right now and send and support missionaries to the ends of the earth? Is it really? Should we wait and see what happens in Russia first? Should we wait and see what happens with the economy? How will the next election impact how we go and think about the Great Commission? Listen, Jesus is the king with all authority Everywhere, he is with us. He drew the times and the boundary lines of living for all of us. Nothing he has done right now in his providence puts him at a disadvantage in regards to the Great Commission. Nothing. And let's talk about the spirit of the age that William Carey grew up in. The prevailing worldview of the day was the age of reason, the Enlightenment. Reason, they said, had clipped faith's wings. Religion in many places was growing icy, cold, and it was dying. And the biographer says all people of discernment had concluded Christianity to be fiction. That was the day he lived in. 
And here's another lesson of the undeniable evidence that God is never at a disadvantage. So the world thought it was fictional foolishness to preach faith in Jesus Christ crucified at the ends of the earth. God was not backed in a corner by that. Nor was he strategizing for a plan B, thinking, how can I persuade the world to be in favor of my ideas before we send anybody? 1 Corinthians 1.18, the word of the cross is foolishness. And then sometimes, in some places, it's fiction to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let's talk about the church scene in England as William Carey grew up. It's interesting. Bible serious churches split into two camps. There was the Church of England, Anglicanism, and they were serious Bible people back in those days. And then those who split away from them were called the nonconformists, sometimes called particular Baptists. This latter group was reformed in doctrine, and they were Bible serious people, but they didn't believe the scriptures warranted infant baptism like the Church of England did. This group over here, this, these nonconformists, they loved the solas, they loved the doctrines of grace. But they held to believers' baptism. Many of these over here tried to maintain friendly relations with the Church of England where they could. But even still, they were not taken seriously by the Church of England. They were in the power centers of the big cities like London. Religious power, religious influence was not found in those country churches. It was found in London. Small, inconsequential, rural, reformed Baptist churches had no credibility. Is that a disadvantage for God? Not in the least. That didn't put him at a disadvantage he never made his great commission dependent on your church's credibility in the eyes of other churches. What about inside those little Baptist churches? During his first 32 years in England, theological threats and obstacles abounded in the very churches that he pastored in and was associated with. Something called hyper-Calvinism ruled the day. That was the overemphasis on God's sovereignty and the salvation of the lost to the extent that man's responsibility to evangelize the lost vanished. Churches did not feel compelled at all to go to the ends of the earth to preach the gospel because in their faulty theology, they left God in his sovereignty entirely to ingather the lost himself. If he wants to save them, he'll do another Pentecost or something. They thought churches in his day were paralyzed, evangelistically speaking. Here's that lesson again. Undeniable evidence that God is never at a disadvantage. God was not surprised by that theological error. Listen, he also was not pleased with it. But it did not tie his hands. Because all authority has been given to him in heaven and earth. And he is with us always. And he determined these times and these boundaries, and he just says, go. It's quite a list of disadvantages piling up here to the Great Commission. There's national threats, international threats, the adversarial spirit of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of worldview at the time, the condition of church-to-church -church relationships and reputations and theological threats abounding within the church. Let's go back to the time around his conversion. When he finished his education at age 14, his father put him in an apprenticeship under a shoemaker. That was what William Carey was. He was a secondhand shoe repairman and salesman. And as a young teen, this is great. I'm glad there's some teenagers in here. Carey was not saved as a young teen, but he worked alongside another young man named John War who was converted and talked openly of spiritual things to William Carey and pointed him to Christ. The biographer says this about John War. That young man had no idea that in urging Carey towards Christ, he was helping to add India's jewel to the diadem of Christ. Helping annex another continent for Christ. 
Let's talk about the lesson of an undisputable characteristic of a useful life. And it has to do with John War. You have no idea what God might have planned for the one that you're discipling right now who might not even be a believer yet. John War had no idea. God knew exactly what he was doing. Junior high, high schooler, if you got a part-time job and you're working along some other knuckleheads like you at Flippin' Burger someplace, talk about spiritual things. Point them to Christ. You have no idea what God might be doing to send another missionary to the ends of the earth in about 10 years. And there's another lesson category, undeniable evidence here that God is never at a disadvantage. The, this list of disadvantages is long, it seems, from our vantage point. Carey only had an eighth grade education. Now, he self-taught himself from there on, masterfully so, and he was poor. And God never says, man, I wish I would have thought of that. God never says, why didn't I put him in a rich family in London and send him to Cambridge? Why didn't I do that? He just was never at a disadvantage, never crossed his mind. Let's go back to his gifting from God. From a young age, before he was ever converted, he proved to have a skill or a gift for language. Get this, at, at age 12, he memorized 60 pages of Latin vocabulary. That probably tipped off mom and dad. This kid's got some abilities. And when he was training to be a shoemaker, still an unbeliever, he saw his master's Greek New Testament commentary, opened it up and wondered what the unknown script was that was in it. It was Greek. He was hooked to learn it, not even saved. Later, he learned Italian, French, and Dutch. And of course, once he was saved, he learned biblical Hebrew and Greek. What lessons can we learn, too, at least, about the unmistakable pathway to the unreached? God was making it clear just where Kerry should focus his life and ministry based on the skill set that he gave him. It was no accident that he was good with languages. It was on purpose that he was good with languages and had that language capability. And another lesson on undisputable characteristics of a useful life. Oh man, once you are saved, you sharpen those skills that God has given to you. Use them well. What did God use to focus him like a laser on the ends of the earth? When he was a boy, he was constantly talking about Christopher Columbus and his discoveries. He talked about it so much so that the boys that he played with called him Columbus. And as a boy, William Carey became fascinated with the logbooks of Captain Cook, who was a voyager and adventurer. He read the accounts of islands in the South Pacific, and he was riveted. And when Carey was converted and in pastoral ministry, the biographer says this, the logbooks of Cook changed into something deeper. They became a revelation of the sin and the sorrow, the immorality, the cruelty, and the misery of unevangelized peoples. A drama of the world's tragic ignorance of Christ. That's what he saw in those log books. He saw a door opening into hell through those books, those log books. The peoples of the South Seas and the coasts of New Zealand, though so likable, were also so barbarian. War was their chief sport. Their victors often cannibal celebrations. All was pushed deeply into his soul, and his compassion was aroused to an inextinguishable degree. The South Seas began to lure William Carey. He dreamed of other ships other than Cook's Endeavor and Resolution, uh, Resolution speeding on an even nobler errand, ships chartered with preachers of saving grace. Captain Cook's logbooks were the match that lit the torch in Carey's heart and made him yearn to be a missionary. Let's talk about the lesson of the unmistakable pathway to the unreached. Listen, the Bible told William Carey that the gospel needed to go to every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. But what God used on top of that foundation is the actual condition in his day, in Carey's day, the history of the ends of the earth. As Carey was curious about those peoples, as he read about them, the Bible's command to go only deepened its thrust into his heart. 
The pathway to the unreached at the ends of the earth is unmistakable for God. The Bible tells you where to go. And in our day, today, news of the conditions of language groups in faraway places like the mountain chains of Papua New Guinea only burden your heart and weigh on your heart all the more if you are on that pathway to go. Do you know what the Bible says about the unreached at the ends of the earth? And are you curious about the conditions of those who are still unreached? Let's think again about the time period in which Carrie was saved. God saved him most likely at the age of about 17 and a half in 1779. Think about that. Think of what was happening to Great Britain. By the way, who named, who said, we're not just Britain. We're Great Britain. I don't know. Um, Think of what is happening to Great Britain in the American colonies. Think what's happening in flyover country, in the poverty of a rural, small town, in that association of churches that are despised by London, in churches that are plagued with bad doctrine. God was not at that time biting his nails thinking, man, I really got myself into a corner. No, God was near. God had all authority. And God was at work saving his nobody from nowhere who had no influence to eventually bring the gospel to an entire continent. Again, another lesson of undeniable evidence that God is never at a disadvantage Impoverished rural England was only a position of advantage for God. How could it be anything else? God is never disadvantaged. Listen, right now, you are not disadvantaged because of where you think you are, regardless of how it looks to you. After William Carey's conversion, though most likely he was saved at the age of 17 in 1779, it took him about four years before he really had assurance of salvation that he was truly saved. And that was because he was not very spiritually established at all. He was easily influenced by some heretical mystics in his day who destabilized his faith and he flirted with heresy, not knowing how dangerous it was to his soul. And it took time for God to clear that dense fog from his sight. And again, that was not a disadvantage to God. The list keeps growing. A young believer's foolishness and spiritual instability. Listen, that is nothing to wink at. It's serious. But even that is not an obstruction to God. He knows how to overcome that too. And the same is true for you. The same is true for me. You may be immature. You may be uh, littered in the past behind you with some really foolish decisions. Uh, God can overcome those things. He does all the time. What about his family life? In 1781, sometime between when he was converted and before he had his assurance of salvation, in 1781, he married his first wife, Dorothy. She was 20 years old, and so was William. Listen, his wife could not read or write. She couldn't sign the marriage certificate. In fact, the marriage certificate was loaded with all kinds of misspellings by whoever did the writing. And that is good evidence for you of the lowliness of the people that William Carey came out of. Illiterate people who had a burden for the ends of the earth. Undeniable evidence that God is never at a disadvantage. Can you imagine that? God stepped into people who could not read, they could not write their name, and he plucked from them his servant to go to the ends of the earth. You know what, that's what we're counting on in Mare Roro, Papua New Guinea, that God will take somebody who doesn't even know how to read or write their language yet, but God's going to use them in the next tribe, the next language group. More about his family life, in 1783, In their second year of marriage, William and Dorothy's first child, Anne, died from the fever that was going around at age one. He didn't have to get to India to start suffering. Rural England was a tough place to live and die. And shortly after that, William Carey himself had the fever for 18 months straight. 
It was so severe that it left him permanently bald. By the way, he was five feet, four inches and permanently bald. Now, I don't know what lesson category this next thing fits in, but it, but it was a dangerous world to live in in rural England. It wasn't like William had to leave the comforts of rural England to experience hardship and disease. It was dangerous to live where he lived. It was dangerous to live in India from our perspective. Sickness and disease and tragedies and accidents, they don't care where you live. Listen, just pick the dangerous place in the world that you think God will use you the most. Just be careful of thinking that, of the thinking that says, well, I'm safest where I'm, I'm most familiar with life. Are you? You're safest when you are living in the will of God wherever he puts you. Let's think about the poverty of the day. As Carrie was a pastor in a small church in a village in rural England in 1783 to about 1784, a really severe winter hit. The British trade was paralyzed because of its humiliating defeat in America. Kerry was already poor. Along with all of his church members, they couldn't pay him enough as a pastor to support him. He couldn't provide for his family, even enough through his secondhand shoemaking. And so in the evenings, he opened a school and he taught school all while he pastored. And even then, he was not able to take care of his family. And out of that poverty, other people gave benevolence to help him. And out of that whole poverty came a world missions launch that nobody saw coming. Listen, you would not make it in your plan. Let's find the poorest people, people who can't read, people who are looked down upon everybody else. Let's go start there. That sounds like a great idea. You and I just don't think that way. But that's what God has to work with, and he's never at a disadvantage. What matters most is how God sees your providence that he puts you in. And he never gives by his providence that which disadvantages him on the Great Commission with you. World missions leapt forward out of that poverty. So don't despise the providence that you have been given by God if it's bitter. God didn't give to you or withhold from you in such a way that it tied his hands from accomplishing what he wants to do next with you. Do you understand that? Let's talk about his pastoral ministry a little bit. For the eight years prior to his leaving for India, from the age of 24 to 32, he pastored in two different churches, four years of time in each one. The first four years, he was in a tiny little village. And the last four years, he pastored in a little bit bigger town, but still in the rural area. The churches that he was in were a disciplinary mess, there was theological disaster everywhere. One of the churches was antinomian. They, they were living in a shamefully lawless condition. They were plagued by hyper-Calvinism as he tried to correct that errant theology and push for evangelism and, and for missionary zeal. He was mislabeled as an Arminian, a man-centered, theologically-minded man. He was labeled a heretic, so he's trying to correct all of this, and people saw his correction, and it was so foreign to them, they thought, that must be heresy. He's a heretic. The next missionary to India was viewed as a heretic at one point. He pastored in churches where they were, there were theological minefields everywhere. Every next step was an opportunity for him to blow himself up. And let's think about the unmistakable pathway to the unreached. The great missionary was a great churchman. A great churchman makes a great missionary. Carrie's pathway to the mission field of unreached language groups in India, it ran right through the heart of the local church. Where did God want this future great missionary to sharpen his missionary conviction? Where did he want to stoke the flame of his missionary zeal? In church. What kind of churches? Uh, churches that weren't firing on all theological cylinders. Churches that desperately needed help. Weak churches. 
churches flirting with heresy. Taking a missionary-minded man like him, a missionary burdened man like him, and stalling him for eight years in churches like that. Why would you do that? Just get out of that place and go. Listen, that was not a detraction from what God wanted to do. It was a prerequisite for what God wanted to do and accomplished through William Carey in India. How can a man want to build up and defend an imperfect church among unreached people at the ends of the earth if he won't first do it where God in his providence has put him? Let me state it negatively. If a man won't engage in the difficulties that plague the local church where he lives, you have no confidence to send him to the ends of the earth and that he'll do it there. No confidence. Laboring in messy local churches who couldn't imagine sending a missionary to India did not suck the life out of William Carey's missionary zeal. His missiology flourished there in sickly churches that he labored to make healthy and strong and equipped. So rather than detract Carey from missions, these weak churches equipped him for missions. When you focus on the church, you are only helping your missionary zeal. You're only helping it. If you leapfrog the church or you sidestep the church thinking that you're going to get to the mission field, you're only hurting yourself and you're not honoring the Lord as you could. There's another lesson. The undisputable characteristics of a useful life. Do you want to be useful to the Lord wherever you are? Look on the imperfections in your church and do not retreat to the sideline and look for rocks to start throwing. Love the bride of Christ. Love the body of Christ. Step toward the souls that are sinking in whatever weaknesses plague the body of Christ that God ever puts you in throughout your life. And do that until God closes every door. You have no idea how your efforts to strengthen the church that God has put you in by his providence might actually end up advancing the gospel to places unknown. Don't give up on the church with all of her blemishes. There's another lesson, and it's the undeniable evidence that God is never at a disadvantage again. If you told me that a church was poor, it was plagued by sanctification issues, and and it was convinced, it was convinced theologically, that it should not send missionaries to the lost because, well, God will just do that himself when he's good and ready. I'd tell you that no missionary will come out of that church. Huge red flags of disadvantages everywhere. And yet that is not what God saw. And now let's be complete in our thinking. God hates lawlessness. God hates errant theology that fails to foster evangelistic zeal and efforts. But God's providential path for Cary was never obstructed by such a church because God's providence for those messy churches was that the missionary himself would be the one to strengthen them for missions. Cary didn't sit back and throw rocks at the imperfections of the churches that he pastored in. Oh, he lamented them. He wept over those people but he pastored them and he built them up and he preached truth to them so that God's word would do its one-of-a-kind work in those churches. Laboring in a sickly church was not a detraction from missions. It was a prerequisite for missions. Listen to what the biographer said. And we'll close with this. The Lord crowded many formative experiences into Carey's 10 years in the village and hamlet of his beginnings. He learned his trade, to shoemaking. He was initiated into Greek, discovered his sins and his savior. He accepted the reproach of nonconformity. He hammered out his Christian faith and doctrines, making sound shoes for his pilgrimage to India. He tasted the joys of marriage, the ecstasy of fatherhood, He tasted the anguish of child bereavement and the ordeal of poverty. 
In these years, he first labored at teaching. He bore his first Christian witness. He took his first vows of church membership. He preached his first sermon. He rendered baptismal obedience, caught the heart-rending condition of lost heathendom, and he even led his sisters into saving grace. The one who has all authority in heaven and on earth drew the the lines of Carrie's time and the habitation of his dwelling, where he would live. And he used everything that he put in there by his providence and everything he kept from William Carey by his providence, he used. And it never disadvantaged God. And my friend, that's you. And that's me. That's us. He drew a line around you. You live when you live. You live where you live. You've had the bitter providences that you've had. You've had the blessings that you've had. There's been many things withheld from you. And none of it disadvantages God with what he wants to accomplish through you, either at the ends of the earth or right here. God is never at a disadvantage in your life in any way, ever. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this great news that is on display through your choice servant, William Carey. We're so thankful for men and women like him that litter Christian history, redemptive history. And Lord, I pray for us that we would take courage to be faithful where you have us. Please grow us in characteristics that make us useful for you, the most useful that we can be. Thank you for the gifts and the skills that you give to weak men and women like us. Help us to develop those gifts and use them for your glory, whether it's in our homes with our children and grandchildren or whether it is at the ends of the earth among people who do not know how to read or write yet. Father, may you find us easy to move when you say go. Let us not be entrenched in the sad thoughts we have about the bitter providence you have us in. Lord, let us not draw the lines of our habitation where we think we should live and dwell and not let you move us outside of that. Let us trust your good hand and your good providence towards us. We have nothing to fear. Have your way in us for your glory, both here and at the ends of the earth. We love you, and we need you desperately. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.